Hello everybody. This is a follow-up to the last video of Who is Satan on the Flat Earth? Today's video is called God the Sun on the Flat Earth. I wanted to make this to kind of answer a little bit of the criticism that some people have um, come up with concerning my use of that term. As you know, the New Testament usually says the Son of God. But the thing to understand is this. The one thing that makes Christianity unique is the identity of Jesus. Jesus said that he was the Son of Man. Many, many of the scriptures declare that he was the Son of God. Jesus called God himself his own Father. The question is, can we also call Jesus God the Son. There seem to be many these days, including some Christians, who say that we can't. Some seem to believe he was just a man before his crucifixion. Some people believe he became an ascended master like their God Buddha or Krishna. The thing, too, that I have to say right off the bat is this whole idea that Jesus was just a a great teacher or an ascended master is ludicrous because it means that he lied about everything. So he wouldn't have been a great teacher. He would have been nothing. Either Jesus was God on earth as a man or Christianity is an utterly false religion. Now, I believe that Christianity is true, totally true, and that the sum of God's word is truth. Now, the first and simplest proof that Jesus was God the Son is that he personally rebuked Satan. Now, recall Jude's words concerning rebuking Satan. Jude uh, consists of just one chapter. In verse 8, it says this, Yet in like manner these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now think about that. Michael, although an archangel, that is, one of God's highest created beings, would not personally rebuke Satan. He would not personally bring a blasphemous judgment against Satan. Michael understood authority. He understood delegated authority. He understood the authority that he had under God, and he, under, he understood God's authority. He understood the Lord's authority, and he used the Lord's authority to rebuke Satan, not his own authority. The archangel Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. The question is, who is this Lord that Michael refers to? Okay, let's now consider the temptation of Jesus by Satan at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. And uh, that's recounted very well in Matthew chapter 4. And it goes like this. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now he's quoting scripture here. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now here Satan is quoting scripture. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And Jesus once again uses the scripture to answer Satan's temptation. 
Then verse 8, with the third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now, have you ever considered this, that from the top of a very high mountain, if we did live on a globe, you couldn't see all the kingdoms. If you go high enough on a mountain on a plane, where the plane is the whole earth, you could literally see everything so long as your eyes can see that far. Just an aside here concerning the reality that Jesus created a flat earth and not the globe that all the scientists pretend that we live on. So the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, Satan said to Jesus, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now clearly here, Jesus rebuked Satan himself. Remember, the archangel Michael appealed to the Lord to rebuke Satan. But here in Matthew 4, verse 10, Jesus Christ rebuked Satan himself. Jesus Christ, then, must be the Lord that Michael appealed to, as recounted in the book of Jude. Then, let's look at a couple other scriptures. Matthew 16, verse 23, and Mark chapter 8, verse 33, where Jesus says he has to go to Jerusalem. And, of course, this has to do with his coming crucifixion. Peter tries to prevent him from going to Jerusalem. Says, surely you shall not go there. Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now here, clearly, Satan had influenced Peter's mind so that Peter tried to stop Jesus from going to Jerusalem. Jesus, who saw was, who was controlling Peter's mind, instantly rebuked Satan. So once again, we see that the Lord rebukes Satan and that that Lord is Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Now the second very simple proof that Jesus was God the Son is that he accepted worship before his crucifixion while he was yet a man. Now remember, and we read this just a bit ago, Matthew chapter 4, the third temptation says, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So here Jesus makes it very clear that only the Lord God should be worshipped. Well, who is Jesus referring to here? Well, first of all, when he said that you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve, he is really condensing several scriptures. And the first uh, that came to my mind is the first two of the Ten Commandments. These are found in Exodus chapter 20. And then also, um, I believe that he is referencing a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 15. Now, both of these books were written by Moses. Exodus is the second book of Moses. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of Moses. And both of these books are part of what is called the Torah or Torah, the Jewish Torah. Exodus 20 Verses 1 through 6 say this, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Then, Deuteronomy 6, verses 10 through 16, says, And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, those are the Jewish fathers, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Now, in the English Standard Version of the Bible, which is what I generally use, in this verse from Matthew where the Lord rebukes Satan and says you shall worship only the Lord your God, this is the verse that it references. Deuteronomy 6, verse 13, and I'll read that again. It is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. And then this passage is summed up with verse 16 that says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Now isn't that interesting? This was one of the scriptures also that Jesus used when he answered Satan's first temptation. Now, many people like to um, criticize the God of the Old Testament and say, oh, he's just a jealous God, you know, and they, they use jealousy in a negative sense, but God is not a jealous God in a negative sense. He's a jealous God in the sense that he loves you and therefore, he's going to do everything that he can in order for you to come to him and in order for you to have the abundant life that he wants to give you. That's what that's all about. But who is this jealous God? Who is this God of the Old Testament? Remember that Jesus quoted this last verse when Satan tempted him to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple to prove to the people that he was the Son of God. Jesus made it very clear to Satan that only God is to be worshipped. Now let's look at another verse. Matthew 14, 22 says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. Now this is late. This is between three and six in the morning. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith! Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Here we see that all of the disciples worship Jesus. Jesus accepts their worship. But Jesus told Satan that only God may be worshipped. 
logically, clearly, this shows that Jesus is God. Therefore, Jesus is God the Son. Now also consider John 9, verse 35, and following where it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. So there was a man that Jesus had healed, and the Pharisees cast him out because he was proclaiming that Jesus had healed him. So Jesus heard, heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. So Jesus answered the man after the man worshipped him. He didn't say, Don't worship me, you can only worship God. No, he accepted the worship because he is God. He is God. He is God the Son. Notice here that he also pronounces judgment upon the Pharisees. So as God, he tells the Pharisees, your sin remains. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read almost the entire first chapter. Incredible book. This is, uh, I call it, uh, the second book of Revelation because of the spiritual revelation that's contained in this book. It begins, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. There again we see this idea of worship where God is stating, Let God's angels worship him. And yet we know that God says, You shall worship me alone. See, what we're seeing here is the identity of Jesus Christ as being that God that spoke to Moses from the burning bush, that spoke to Moses on the mountain and gave him the Ten Commandments and said, you shall worship me only and you shall never make an idol to represent me. Hebrews 1, 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So, calling the Son God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness, uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, I want to stop on that verse. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. That is the defining characteristic of the true Christian. And that is what defines Christianity and sets it apart from every other religion. Every other religion has a relative morality where right and wrong is not defined. 
That's why today's Christians are so confused, because Satan has been very good in getting people elected into office and getting people into schools, universities, newspapers, and so on, who preach incessantly tolerance, diversity. Tolerance of what? Tolerance of sin. Tolerance of wickedness. Tolerance of unrighteousness. Diversity. Diversity from what? Being diverse from righteousness. In other words, getting involved with wickedness. Doing things that God says are wrong, evil. About Jesus. I'm going to start at the beginning of this scripture again. This is verse 8 of Hebrews 1. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. That's the rod of authority. That's the rod of iron. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Here again, affirming that Jesus is the creator. He's the creator of the world. He's the one who created this flat earth that we live on, who created the firmament above. He is the one who wrote the scripture through his prophets. He is the word made flesh. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Jesus Jesus Christ, more accurately pronounced Yahusha HaMashiach, was God the Son, who lived in the flesh on earth 2,000 years ago. The I Am, the Aleph Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who revealed the end from the beginning. Yahusha Hamashiach, God the Son, God in the flesh, who came for us, for his creation, and died for his own creation, so that we could live forever with him with the kind of life that he has and with the type of perfection and righteousness that he is. Amen.